Is it nice to be back in Bry, Idaho? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I know one thing because Emily is in Dal uh, in Fort Worth, and I watched the calendar, you know, Dallas, and right then and right then.
receive the spirit of slavery, but rather the spirit of adoption. Your guilt has departed. Your sin is blotted out. For we are all God's beloved children, forgiven, loved, and free. In Jesus Christ, we are all forgiven. Thanks be to God. And now the peace of Jesus Christ be with you all and also with you. I invite you to take a moment to share the peace of Christ with your neighbor in whatever way is comfortable to you. And of course, as always, you're welcome to pull out your phone and text the peace to someone that you don't see here. Uh, remember that we are connected by more than just physical presence, but by the Spirit. Um, and I like that we are the song so much that I left it in after the sharing of the peace. So we can enjoy that. So, May we always wonder, 
And may we always love and appreciate you. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Testament reading for today uh, will be from John's Gospel, chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, and then 9 through 14. Listen now for the word of the Lord. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word was with God in the beginning. Everything came into being through the Word, and without the Word, nothing came into being. What came into being through the word was life, and the life was the light for all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness doesn't extinguish the light. The true light that shines on all people was coming into the world. The light was in the world, and the world came into being through the light, but the world didn't recognize the light. The light came to his own people, and his own people didn't welcome him. But those who did welcome him, those who believed in his name, he authorized to become God's children, born not from blood, nor from human desire or passion, but born from God. The word became flesh and made his home among us. We have seen his glory, glory like that of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O Lord of mystery beyond our understanding, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts together be acceptable in your sight. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today is what's affectionately known by many preachers as Heresy Sunday. Devoting a week's worship to the Holy Trinity seems like a really great idea in principle, but if you've ever attempted to explain the Trinity to anyone who's unfamiliar with the doctrine, you can understand why this is actually one of the most challenging Sundays of the year to preach. The Trinity is such a strange concept Three equal and unified persons of the same substance somehow contained within a single God. It's so strange that humanity has yet to discover an analogy that doesn't accidentally slip into heresy in one way or another. Of course, it doesn't help that the doctrine of the Trinity isn't strictly scriptural. I mean, the church didn't come up with the idea out of thin air. References to the Father, the Son, the 
Holy Spirit, even all three together, are sprinkled throughout both the Old and the New Testaments. But generally, they're mentioned without any explanation as to their nature or their relation to one another. Whenever we consider whether a particular statement about the Trinity might be orthodox or heretical, we're actually leaning heavily on the work of the church in the fourth century rather than on scripture itself, 400 years almost after Jesus. It was the Council of Nicaea in 325 that established the Father and the Son as separate persons of the same substance, and the 381 Council of Constantinople that elevated the Spirit to the same status within Christian belief. After almost 400 years of living in ambiguity regarding the Trinity, these official ecclesial bodies finally gave the church some answers. Except that 1,640 years later, we're still struggling to understand this strange quirk of our faith. It turns out that these assemblies were, in fact, the very first examples of a church committee taking a long time to deliberate, only to ultimately decide something divisive and confusing. For all their debate and controversy, the councils really clarified very little for us. Maybe, though, that's not necessarily their fault. Maybe we're not meant to understand the Trinity. Maybe it's something so far beyond our pen as human beings that we'll only understand it when we encounter God face to face in the life to come, if even then. Maybe that's why scripture doesn't even attempt any sort of explanation. One isn't possible. Consider what the members of these councils had to work with. The closest thing I can think of to a scriptural, a scriptural description of the Trinity is the beginning of John's Gospel, which I just read. And this passage makes it clear that God is not meant to be pinned down by our mortal minds. God, the Word, and the Light aren't direct parallels to the three persons of the Trinity in any way, but through these lyrical words, we're able to see the faintest glimmer of what the eternal, playful dance of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit must be like, all without gaining any real intellectual understanding. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. What came into being through the Word was life, and the life was the light for all people. No logical explanation, no clear analogy, no precise definition can come as close to capturing the essence of the Trinity, somehow both and. God with and through and as God's self, as these enigmatic words do. And maybe we just have to be content with that. I think that this might be why I'm so often drawn to the Old Testament readings in the lectionary. The disciples are always nagging Jesus for explanations in the gospel, and Paul's always trying to offer them through his letters. But the Old Testament doesn't really seem to have this incessant lust for understanding. It rarely attempts to assign explicit meaning to its stories. It just presents them as they were handed down through the centuries. It allows the reader to hear whatever it is that the Spirit is trying to communicate in the moment. While appealing to my theological side, this can sometimes make preaching Old Testament the Old Testament a frustrating experience. The lectionary's choice of Isaiah's false story for Trinity Sunday is a strange one. God's question in verse 8, who will go for us, is really the only apparent reference that could even vaguely be interpreted as alluding to three persons in one God. And that connection, let's be honest, is tenuous at best. But if we let go of our obsessive need to understand what God is, to understand the mechanics of the Trinity, if we can step back and try to see through Isaiah's eyes, maybe, like him, we can begin to see what it is that we really need to understand. 
When Isaiah sees the Lord in his vision, the dramatic scene doesn't suggest anything about the confusing nature of what God is. No mention of a son or a spirit or even a father, not even any inkling, aside from the angels surrounding the throne, that Isaiah is in the presence of anything even remotely difficult to understand. In fact, Isaiah sees God in a context that's not even innately divine at all. If you cut out the seraphim and you replace the word Lord with King, this passage could just as easily be describing any earthly ruler. Now, we usually read God's divinity into this passage, attributing the mysterious, immortal, somehow one but also three substance to the Lord that we've been conditioned to assume ever since the first time that we walked into a sanctuary. We allow that idea to color how we imagine God in every context. But while it's not wrong, it's also not what Isaiah's vision describes. He doesn't spend any time attempting to explain God's material substance. Instead, he focuses on the qualities of God's nature rather than its composition. This he has the language for. This is something that the human brain can begin to understand. Isaiah sees God as a king, not because God literally sits in a throne in the sky all day making royal proclamations, we know that. Isaiah sees God as a king because that's an image within his pen, within his understanding to which he could refer in order to try and understand what it was he needed to know about God in that moment. He had no frame of reference for three persons in one God, but he had encountered a king before. It was a simple matter to imagine God as a superlative king, one with the highest throne, the largest throne, the loudest admirers, and the greatest authority and power. Through the lens of his pre-existing human knowledge, Isaiah finds that he can describe some of God's qualities. Although no metaphor, heretical or otherwise, is sufficient to precisely convey the full concept of the Trinity to our human minds, at least this vision is able to get Isaiah a little bit closer to the knowledge of God that matters. Instead of doing mental gymnastics to try and understand what God is, maybe we should take a page out of Isaiah's book and spend more time and more energy trying to understand who God is. In Isaiah's context, his country was at that moment beset by the threat of foreign invasion and impending exile. So his vision of God as the most powerful of all rulers spoke directly to the aspect of God's nature that he most needed to know. In our context, a mighty king might not be the same aspect of God that we need to recognize at this moment. Perhaps if we were to see a divine vision of God today, we would see an empathetic therapist helping us to examine our own flaws and shortcomings while still feeling heard and seen. Or maybe a peacemaking diplomat creating compassion and compromise out of hostilities and hatred. Between the escalating aggressions between Israel and Palestine right now that we have heard so much about, and the bitter division afflicting our own country in our own backyard, God knows that we need to understand this particular <coughs> character of the divine more than we need to agree on the semantics of what God is made up of. After all, the one thing about the Trinity that we can know for certain is that God exists in relationship, and God wants us to exist in relationship too. Faith isn't just about who or what God is, it's about how and why we respond to God. We don't need to have a solid intellectual grasp 
on the concept of the Holy Three in One to live this way. Although neither of today's readings do very much to clarify what God is made up of, both offer a description of the human reaction to God's character. In Isaiah, the prophet responds to God's clear power and majesty, first by repenting of his own iniquity, then by volunteering himself as an emissary to the people. In John, the people who understand God's nature as the giver of life and the conqueror of evil respond by welcoming the divine and choosing to join God's family. An understanding of the Trinity may be beyond their ken, but they can understand God's nature, and they can choose to respond in faith. When we are granted insight into God's character, how do we respond? When we hear about God's mercy, God's inclusion, God's peace, God's justice, do we seek to take part in it in whatever way we can? Or do we push aside what we do know and what we can do because we're determined to first find the right answer within an incomprehensible mystery? Do we place orthodoxy above orthopraxy, that is correct belief over a faithful response? Are we unable to recognize and welcome God's light because we're preoccupied with the wrong things? Even if we could understand the mechanics of the Trinity, that knowledge probably wouldn't be able to give us much more than a smug sense of self-satisfaction. But when we instead seek to understand God's nature for the purpose of informing our faithful response, we gain so much more connection, hope, purpose, and a glimpse of God's holiness. Scripture doesn't place any sort of emphasis on understanding the Trinitarian mystery, and neither should we. That's why we baptize infants before they have any sort of concept of God, and why we offer communion to anyone regardless of their level of understanding. It's not our knowledge of God's substance, but of God's character that compels our response. And our response is the whole point. Otherwise, why would God send prophets to guide the people towards redemption? Why would the word become flesh and dwell among us if our response didn't matter? Let's be satisfied with the brilliant glimpses of the divine that we can perceive. Let us be humbled by the mysteries beyond our ken and let us respond in faith in whatever way we're able, the ways within our can. Amen. Friends, I invite you now to reflect on the words here read from Scripture, the word preached, and whatever the Spirit is moving in your heart at the moment um, as we hear our offertory. Um, I ask that we especially reflect on what it is we can do. What can we offer to God? How can we engage in God's character even without understanding the what or how of God? As always, our offering plates are at the back of the sanctuary and at the doors. You can always mail or drop a check into our mailbox, or you can go to our website, boonpcusa.org, and there's a donate button if you prefer to donate electronically. Um, please reflect on what it is you have to offer God, not just financially, but with your energy and your time and your presence.
Um, friends, let us respond in our initial response to God's uh, word and love for us using the words of the Apostles' Creed, knowing that our response goes beyond just saying, yes, we believe, but also knowing that that is a good place to start. Let us stand as we're able, in God your spirit, and I will, I will recite on behalf of the people and John will be signed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. And now, friends, we come to the time of worship where we lift up our prayers before our God and before one another. And just in case you're concerned, we are still in heaven. I just moved it towards the end, so in case I'm the one that has to sing it like I am this week, um, I can have a little bit of a break between preaching. So we will be singing a hymn, but first we will lift up our prayers before God and one another. You are welcome, of course, to text them to me, as always, if you have one and you forgot your phone or something, just let me know, um, and I will lift them up for the, before the congregation. Um, a few prayer requests. First of all, um, prayers on this Memorial Day weekend as we give thanks uh, for those willing to give their life for our country to protect us. Um, and for those who have given the altar Christ, may we remember them, may they be with God in peace um, this weekend and always. Also, prayers for Bill Buckendorf. Continue prayers. His recovery is going well. Um, and they send their love, but um, still is not up to being in worship today. So um, continue prayers for uh, continued recovery um, and all good things on that front. Uh, thirdly, as I mentioned in my sermon, let's pray for Israel and Palestine, knowing that um, that is a conflict that even though it is so far away, it is still um, a part of, of our story in a way, um, and that as a global community, we uh, watch that and pray for a peaceful resolution. Uh, so let's continue praying for them. I <laughs> um, don't see any other prayer requests. I don't see any prayer requests in the congregation, so let's continue to pray then. Gracious God, we come before you, dwelling in the mystery of your being, but knowing that we can respond to your character, which you show us in so many ways. Your character of love that sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to redeem us. Your character of peace, which your people sought throughout the ages and which you still seek for us. Your character of justice, which weeps and mourns when injustice is done and celebrates when we are able to lift up one another. God, we pray for those whose infirmities, infirmities are, are weighing on them, those whose bodies are not working the way they might hope they could be prayers, that they may know your peace and know your healing, um, and that we might surround them with our love as your community, as your family. God, even as we dwell in the mystery of your holy three in one, let us rejoice in what we do know, that you are love and you are goodness and you are almighty and all-powerful. I want to serve you in all that we do as we pray these words, the prayers that we lift up before you, those spoken aloud, those unspoken on our hearts and those that we don't yet have the words to express, but that your spirit intercedes with sighs to you for words. Let us pray then in the words that your son taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, 
Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
directly after the two days. So it's